Chapter 6 Shu Night came, and the rats came creeping through the bamboo to eat the fallen flowers. Mei-Ling kicked at them, but in her weakened state, they did little more than retreat a foot or so. Her stomach was an aching void. Her throat felt as if she had swallowed a thorn bush, and her limbs felt both heavy and distant. The rats didn't consider her a threat, even with her quarterstaff. How long, she wondered in weary desperation, until they started considering her food. She had lost track of the days. Once again, she was at an intersection of paths in the great bamboo maze, and there was no indication of which one would lead to freedom, water, or any kind of sustenance. Every strategy she had tried had met with failure. G butted her hip and sat down heavily, dragging at her with her paw. Maylin hesitated, then gave in and slowly sat down, almost collapsing into a bed of bamboo flowers. She didn't have the strength to fight her spirit animal anymore. G raised a paw to her ear and moved her head very slowly from side to side. Listen? You want me to listen? asked Maylin. To what? Maylin frowned, but she listened. At first, all she could hear was the faint rustling of the bamboo, as some breeze high above moved the topmost shoots. It certainly didn't penetrate down below, where the air remained humid and still. She heard the rats rustling around her, occasionally squeaking at each other. There were so many of them, growing fat on the fallen flowers while she starved. She leaned against her, and Maylin felt her anger and frustration diminishing. She felt a calmness descend upon her, and she became aware that she was breathing in the same rhythm as the panda. A sense of peace was flowing into her, through the link she had with her spirit animal. She did not know how long she sat, just listening. When G finally heaved herself up, it was night, and there was a rat nibbling the toe of Mei Lin's left shoe. She swished her quarterstaff at it, and it retreated, rustling in its haste to get away from her. The maze was now completely dark, the thick bamboo above hiding even the starlight. Mei-Ling couldn't see anything at all, not even her own hand held up close to her face. She stood up too, holding Ji's fur just behind the panda's head. Despite the darkness and the rats and the incessant gnawing of her gut, she still felt calm. Panda and girl stood like statues, hardly breathing. Her pulse quickened as she heard a faint noise far away, because it was not a natural sound. It was metallic, the soft clang of metal, like a fork upon a tin plate. There's someone nearby, whispered Mei-Lin. Ji stirred at her side and began to walk away. Mei-Lin clutched at her fur. Where are you going? The panda stopped to let Mei-Lin get a better grip then ambled off again. Mei-Lin followed her in the total darkness, trusting that her spirit animal would find the way. It was strangely liberating to just follow the panda in the dark. Mei-Lin couldn't see the thick bamboo walls of the maze. She couldn't see where they were crossing intersections of the paths, and so couldn't feel the terror of not being able to choose the right one. Mei-Lin shut her eyes, and placed all her trust in Ji. Even the day before, Mei-Lin would probably have shouted at the panda, asked Ji where she was taking her, if she was taking her anywhere at all. But tonight she didn't. She stayed calm, and kept her eyes shut, and followed. Ji changed direction. Mei-Lin's shoulder crashed against some bamboo stalks, but not hard. The descent of night had cooled the air, it was almost peaceful. All Mei-Lin had to do was hold on and walk slowly. How long they walked toward the faint metal noise, she didn't know. They moved very slowly, 
and every now and then G would stop and reach between the tall bamboo for some smaller plant, pulling it down and breaking it until she got the succulent shoots at the top, every time showering Mei Lin with flowers and small insects. The sound grew louder and clearer as they walked, the panda unhesitatingly choosing each turn in the maze. Mei Lin wondered what the sound could be. It was very soft and faint, but certainly metallic. She was sure she never would have heard it while she was running around or even walking, desperately trying different paths. Then Ji turned a corner, and Mei Lin saw the faintest glow through her closed eyelids. She opened her eyes, and up ahead she saw the soft light of a campfire. An iron tripod stood above the fire, with a travelling cauldron suspended from it. There was a small, hunched-over figure stirring the pot with a long metal ladle. That was the sound Mei Lin had heard, not the harsh ring of a spoon hitting the cauldron, just the soft scrape and ting as the ladle went gently around and around inside the rim. As Mei Lin drew closer, she could see the little figure was a silver-haired old woman, wrapped in a dark cloak. A very tall pack was propped nearby against the bamboo, a pack loaded with small pots and pans and spoons and knives, a kind of travelling kitchen. The woman was cooking. Mei Lin couldn't tell what was in the pot, but it smelled absolutely wonderful. Suddenly all her hunger, forgotten in her long walk with Chi, returned. It felt like a physical punch to her gut. It was all she could do not to double over and fall piteously to the ground. Greetings, old mother, croaked Mei Lin politely. Her voice hardly sounded human, she thought. Her throat was so dry. May a lost traveller ask for some food and water? I have money. I can pay. The woman turned her head her sharp black eyes looking Mei Lin up and down where she stood in the flickering firelight. Then her eyes darted to Ji. Payment, she said. No payment is necessary for aiding the lost, nor should it be asked. Come, share my fire, my food, my water. Thank you, said Mei Lin. She felt weak in the knees, as much with relief as weariness, as she slowly sank down next to the woman. My name is Mei Lin, and this is... Ji, interrupted the woman. She handed Mei Lin a small but beautiful porcelain cup and filled it with cool, clear water from a water skin. I had heard talk of the return of the great beasts. My name is... You can call me Shu. Mei Lin barely heard her. The water looked magical by firelight, so clear and bright as if it were a pure crystal catching the reflection of the red and yellow flames. And when she brought the cup to her lips, she had to fight the instinct to gulp. She knew that would make her sick. Instead, she sipped at it, taking one small mouthful and slowly allowing it to trickle down her throat. Her body sang with relief. She almost wept. Perhaps the water was magical, it tasted better than any palace cordial. When the cup was empty, Mei Lin held out her shaking hands for more. Shu refilled it three times, until finally Mei Lin judged that she had had enough for now. Would you like some of my stew? asked Shu. Yes, please, said Mei Lin. It smells good. What is it? Rat and bamboo shoots, said Shu. There's no other source of meat left in the forest now. Just thousands and thousands of rats, eating the flowers. Oh, said Mei Lin. She hesitated, then said firmly, I would like some, please, Madame Shu. Just Shu, said the old woman. She leaned around and opened her pack, drawing out a beautiful porcelain bowl from a padded pocket and a matching spoon. She ladled a modest helping into the bowl and passed it to Mei Lin. She dipped in her spoon and raised it to her mouth, just as a flower fell from above right into the stew. She reached over and picked it out with a pair of very sharp-pointed chopsticks 
that had apparently come out of her sleeve. The movement so fast, Malin almost didn't see it. The bamboo dies, bedecking its own grave with flowers, said Shu. It has been a long time since the maize needed replanting. Who will replant it? Malin said bitterly. The devourer and his conquerors have crushed Zhong. They have taken the wall, and now the maize dies. All is not lost, said Shu. The devourer's troops are like the skin on a rice pudding, a shallow covering that can easily be torn aside. Besides, there are still those of Zhong who resist. You know where there are loyalists? Enemies of the devourer? asked Meilin excitedly, her determination undimmed now that she had food in her stomach. That's who I have come to find, to help. Where are they? Shu looked across at Ji, who was contentedly chewing on bamboo shoots. The panda flicked her ears. There is a camp not far away, she said. There have always been hidden fortresses within the maze. The loyalists gather at the South Fort. The South Fort? asked Meilin. But, but I was crossing in the north, the northern entrance to the maze. Impossible. You could not have gotten here from there. You must have come in the southwestern entrance. Maylin stared at the old woman. No wonder I got lost, she said, aghast. I was following the instructions for the wrong part of the maze. You are fortunate that you have the companionship of G, said Shu. No panda is ever lost in a bamboo forest, even one grown deliberately as a maze. Yes, said Maylin, but I didn't listen to her, not at first. In silence, thought begins, said Shu. Eat your stew, sleep. In the morning, I'll guide you to the south fort. Thank you, said Maylin. I, I don't know what I would have done without your help. You have G, said Shu as if she didn't even understand what Maylin was talking about. Yes, said Maylin. She turned to the panda, who was pulling down yet another bamboo stalk. Thank you, Ji. Ji didn't stop shredding bamboo shoots, but Maylin felt a feeling of warmth pass between them, a kind of mental hug. She smiled, lay down next to the panda, and went instantly to sleep. Chapter 7 Two Tigers I don't like this jungle, said Rolan. Give me a city any time. Really? asked Rebecca in surprise. I prefer my home, of course. It's not so wet and misty, but it is still better here than in any city. Uraza likes it too. It was two days since they had escaped Shin Kao Dai. The small party was now sitting in the bow of a slow but comfortable river barge under a gauzy awning that protected them from the sun, from the teeming insects of the jungle all around the canal, and from prying eyes. Brigan sat next to Connor. The blue-eyed wolf watched the jungle riverbank with suspicion, while Uraza lay sprawled half across a becker's lap and half across a bale of some kind of spice, one of many piled high on the barge's deck. Essex, of course was somewhere aloft. I'll be happy to get off this boat, though, added Rebecca. I have been too much on boats. The Tellum's pride was all right, said Rollan. A lot more comfortable than I expected. I was on a ship before that, said Rebecca, when I left my home. With the enemy, Connor started to say. Yes, said Rebecca quietly, though I didn't know it. Brigand shifted at Connor's side, his ears pricking up. Uraza lifted her head too and sniffed the air. Up above, Essex called, a cry that was not her normal hunting whistle. The three straightened up and looked ahead. The barge was heading for a point where the river narrowed for a stretch, and there were islands of matted reeds, some of them big enough to conceal bandits or river pirate boats. Rebecca reached for her bow, quickly strung it, and knocked an arrow. Connor picked up his axe, and Roland drew his knife with one hand 
and pulled back the gauze curtains with the other. I can't see any trouble, said Abeka, scanning the heavily vegetated riverbanks. Connor walked back between two of the bales stacked on the deck and called down into the cabin. Tariq! There were two crewmen some sixty feet back at the stern of the barge, but they didn't look alarmed. One was trimming the large single sail, hauling on the main sheet, while the other held the massive tiller. Brigan growled and stood stiff-legged, responding to some unseen, scented threat. Uraza jumped up onto the bale right at the bow and stared off toward the jungle bank, her tail twitching. What is it? asked Abeka, sensing the unease of her spirit animal. It felt like all the hairs on her arms and neck were standing on end. Essex is definitely picking up something weird, said Rolan. I don't know what, though. Could there be an enemy in those reeds? asked Connor anxiously. Abeka looked where he was pointing. The barge was going to pass very close to an island of swaying river plants, where attackers could easily be hiding. Of course there could be, said Rolan. He kept pulling back the gauze curtains, disturbing the biting insects that had clustered against the gauze. Suddenly the reeds parted. There was a deafening yowl, the flash of movement, and a huge tiger leaped onto the barge. A black tiger with charcoal-coloured fur marked with midnight stripes. It landed on the spice bales and lunged down at Abeka's head. She jumped back, dropping her bow. Uraza leaped to her defence, even though the leopard was much smaller than the tiger. They slashed at each other, jumping from bale to bale, with Brigan following on the deck, lunging at the tiger's tail. Essex hovered overhead, wings beating the air furiously, her screech adding to the cacophony. Roland and Connor stood on opposite sides of the barge, weapons ready. The combat was so fast and furious that they didn't dare join in. The two big cats moved quickly across the bales, yowling ferociously with every bite and scratch. Most of these failed to connect, until Uraza suddenly landed a blow on the tiger's ear, her claws tearing a deep notch. Abeka cheered the leopard on, but her cheers turned to a sudden gasp as Uraza failed to entirely twist out of the way of a vicious swipe. Five trails of blood sprang up on her flank, the mark of the tiger's claw. Brigan howled furiously from the deck, unable to join the combat that danced about on top of the bales. Abeka grabbed her bow, knocked an arrow, and drew it. But even with her quickness, she couldn't get a clear shot. She was joined a moment later by Tariq, who came rampaging out of the cabin, sword in hand. It's a spirit animal, he said, maddened beyond reason. We have to help Uraza, Abeka shouted at him. The tiger was much bigger and stronger than the leopard, though Uraza was slightly faster. The tiger's jaws snapped at Uraza's throat. Only a wild roll saved her. A net, said Connor. The fishing net. I'll get it. He ran down the side of the barge, narrowly avoiding a spice bale that fell off the top of the stack, dislodged by the squalling big cats. The crew had nets with long handles they used to scoop up fish every now and then. If he could get one, it might hold the tiger long enough to tie it up, or kill it if necessary. But before Connor reached the net, there was another roar from the reeds, and a white tiger leaped right over the heads of the green cloaks, straight into the combat. No! shrieked Abeka, thinking that Araza would have no chance against two huge tigers. She frantically shifted her aim, trying to get a clear shot, before lowering her bow in amazement. The white tiger had placed itself between Uraza and the black tiger and was helping Uraza. Its paws batted at the black tiger's head, and when the black tiger tried to get past it, the white tiger butted it firmly away, putting all of its considerable mass to the task. It was the black tiger's turn to stagger, and Abeka waited for the white tiger to lunge for its throat. But the white tiger held back, and only then did she realise that its claws were sheathed, and its mouth was closed. Instead of a fighting roar, it made a strange rumbling noise deep in its throat. Not a purr, 
but not exactly a growl either. Something she couldn't interpret. Whatever the white tiger was doing, it worked. The black tiger retreated from Uraza, and then with a last throaty scream of defiance or madness, it jumped from the barge back to the reed island, only the tip of its raised tail visible as it raced into the jungle. What was that? asked Rolan, staring wild-eyed. That was my brother's spirit animal, said a voice from the rear of the barge. He has been driven mad with grief. Abeka spun around, bringing her bow to bear on a woman, now standing on the boat, boots dripping from the water. She was tall and slender, dressed in hunting leathers, with a green silk scarf tied around her neck, and grey-flecked black hair tied back in a long plait. Her face was dark and weathered, but from age or long years in the open, Rebecca couldn't tell. Perhaps both. A short Zhongyi's bow was on her back, and a curved sword at her side. The woman raised her arm and cried, Josu! The white tiger jumped toward her and vanished in midair, to reappear as the tattoo of a leaping tiger on her forearm. Abeka kept the bow trained carefully on her. Liché, said Tariq, pushing past Abeka with the biggest smile she had ever seen on him. He hurried over to her and clasped both her hands tightly in his. It has been too long. What is this about your brother? Liché's eyes hooded in pain. Her hands twisted, gripped his in turn. Hansan is dead, she said, killed in a skirmish against the conquerors ten days ago. You see what it has done to Jamin. He is mad and strikes out against any spirit animal, thinking them to be things created by the bile. Tariq nodded somberly. It is a terrible thing to lose one's partner, he said. The madness of grief has taken many in such circumstances, human and spirit animal. The conquerors will pay, said Liché, in blood. Do not fear, said Tariq in a calming voice, and his words were meant for Rebecca and the others too. She lowered her bow, and Connor reassured Brigan with a hand in the furry ruff of his neck. We will defeat them, Tariq said, stepping away from the woman. But we will not do so alone. Let me introduce you to my companions, the children who have brought the great beasts back into the world. Some of Liché's anger ebbed as introductions were quickly made, but Abeka could see where Liché's fingernails had left red welts in Tariq's hands. Only three, Liché said with a frown. Where are the Zhongyi's noble girl and Ji? They would be of great help here. Though Ko Kenzit is only an outlying region of Zhong, the people revere Ji. They would flock to our banners if we could show them the great panda. Meilin went ahead of us, seeking a way to help the resistance more centrally in Zhong, said Tariq. Connor looked at him with questioning eyes. This was the truth, Abeka supposed, but it certainly wasn't the whole truth. We don't know where she is exactly right now. My guess is that she will try to cross the wall. She'll do it, said Rolan. She can really move and fight that girl. We hope she will do it, said Connor. I'm sorry, Liché. It was my fault she left. If I hadn't given away... Enough, said Abeka. Everyone who mattered knew what Connor had done and understood why he had done it. They needed to get past it somehow. We're not here because of that, and neither is Liché. Concentrate on getting the slate elephant. That's what matters. Yes, mumbled Connor. You're right. I'm sorry. Stop being sorry, she exclaimed, her usual calm breaking out of frustration. We forgave you already, right, Rolan? Please stop apologizing. Connor opened his mouth to say something, probably sorry again, then shut it and nodded firmly. Liché was watching them closely, but she too said nothing. Abeka decided in that moment she liked the woman for keeping silent when no more needed to be said. 
Abeka is correct, Tariq said. Reaching Dinesh and obtaining the slate elephant talisman is our task. We must set our minds to it. Liché, your message said you had located the elephant himself. What is our path? It's a bit complicated, admitted Liché. I will explain things on the way. We'll leave the river at dusk. There is a good landing spot a few miles ahead, so we will not have to risk wading and attack from the snakeheads. Snakeheads? You've been warned not to trail your hands over the side, not to go in the water? asked Liché. It is because of the snakeheads. They are fish, as long as my arm, and with many sharp teeth. They can't jump, can they? Connor asked. Fortunately not, said Liché. We must prepare. What supplies did you bring? Roland didn't move. Tell us where we're going first, he said. What's complicated? Abeka suddenly realized that Liché had told them about the snakeheads to avoid answering what lay ahead. The green cloak was holding something back, and Roland, as per usual, had sensed her deception. Liché conceded. I am fairly certain that Dinesh is in Farsit Nang, a small area within the lands of the Turgesh. Who or what are the Turgesh? asked Abeka. I've heard of them, said Tariq. They are a strange people, and very dangerous. Will they allow us to search for Dinesh in their lands? asked Connor. They move around a lot, said Liché. If we're lucky, we will be able to avoid them. And if not, asked Abeka. We will ask politely and hope for the best, said Liché. It sounded like a joke, but she wasn't smiling. I don't understand, said Rolan. The Turgesh is what they call themselves, said Tariq in a grim voice. To everyone else, they are known as the Rhino Riders. Chapter 8 The Jungle Path Liché promised them that the journey from the river barge through the jungle would not be easy, and she was right. They travelled single file along a narrow trail through dense, wet undergrowth with overhanging trees and dangling vines that dropped leeches on everyone. Even when Essex spied a wider path nearby, Liché would not let them move off the narrow trail she had chosen. The Turgesh ride the wider ways, she said. We are safer here. I don't get it, said Roland, pushing a broad, wet leaf away from his face. Their spirit animals are rhinos. No, Liché explained. They do not bond with spirit animals, with or without nectar. No one knows why. Possibly it is because, as soon as they can stay on one, every Turgesh child is brought up with a rhino calf. Living with it? Training with it? Ouch, Roland said. Sounds uncomfortable. But still, a rhino would be too big, even for the path Essex can see. I saw one once, in a travelling fair, and it was huge. Rhinos are big, confirmed Abeka. I have only ever seen them in the grasslands, never in country as crowded with trees and vines as this. The rhinos of Farsit Nang are not the same as the Niloan rhino, explained Liché. They are smaller, faster, and meaner, and they are extremely difficult to tame. Think about that. You have all seen wild horses, yes? Imagine a wild rhino, and what kind of rider it takes to master one. That is why we must avoid them, by sticking to the narrow trails. I'd be happier if we could avoid these biting insects, complained Roland, slapping his cheek. He looked at his hand, on which the crushed insect was smeared into a patch of his own blood. He hated the jungle. He even felt a bit sick, as if he might be coming down with something. There are fewer of the blood drinkers in the jungle, away from the river, said Liché, but more leeches and spiders and stinging ants. Look in your boots each morning and hang a hammock to sleep in. I don't know why they like me so much complained Roland, slapping another one. Go and bite Connor. 
Your blood must taste better, said Connor. For once, Roland couldn't think of something snappy in response. And it wasn't just that he was surprised that Connor was finally snarking back. He felt his face where the insects had stung him. Was it his imagination? Or was his cheek swelling up a bit? We will be able to go faster on a wider road, said Abeka. It's still too risky, repeated Lachey. She paused to slash away some kind of creeper that had grown across the path. We've got Essex, said Rolan. She can see any rhinos coming along the path, and we can take cover. Essex and Josur were the only spirit animals currently out and about. All the others were in dormant form. Even Brigan, who was normally at his happiest in the wild, seemed suspicious of the jungle, perhaps because it was closed in and wet. And though Josur had seemed perfectly fine with Uraza, Rebecca thought it might be wise to keep the leopard away from the tiger. Tariq's Lumio was also not keen on the jungle, or was possibly just lazy and wanted to ride. Otters could be like that. That's true, said Tariq. Liché, time is short. I think the risk is too high, Liché said. But if you agree, I will bow to you and take the broader path. Everyone turned to Tariq whose forehead was deeply wrinkled in thought. Very well, then, said Tariq. Let us take the easier, faster way. Rolan and Essex can watch for approaching rhino riders. We must get to Dinesh before the conquerors. How could they know where Dinesh is? asked Lichet. We've been searching for months, and only put all the clues together in these past three days. The conquerors also have a seer, said Tariq like Lenori, and their forces are moving deeper and deeper into Kokensit. And also, I'm becoming paranoid in my age. War has a way of playing on our anxieties. Liché nodded. Very well. We shall take the wider path. Josur made a low rumbling sound and headed off through the jungle, breaking from the path. Liché followed, the others close behind. As they left the path, it started to rain again. It was warm rain, but still annoying. It trickled down under their sailors' coats and got in their eyes and just made everything more miserable. It's so hot, said Connor. Hotter even than midsummer back home. No good for sheep. No good for anyone except biting insects, said Rolan, slipping on some wet undergrowth and steadying himself by putting his hand out against a tree trunk. Are you all right? I slipped, said Roland irritably, shrugging Connor's hand off his elbow. The heat's getting to me too. I'm just not cut out for jungles. Their hike became easier once they got onto the wider trail. It was about eight feet wide, the undergrowth had been well trampled, and there were no annoying vines hanging down from the trees that clustered on either side, and so no sudden showers of leeches either. The rain also stopped, and the sun came out, raising wafts of steam everywhere from the drying vegetation. This is better, said Abeka. It sure is, said Connor. Roland didn't say anything. He felt very tired, and could only nod his head in agreement. There was something he felt he should be doing, but he couldn't remember what it was. Something to do with Essex, who was flying around somewhere. Josur says there is a clearing up ahead, said Liché. Elephant grass, so no cover. We must cross it quickly. Come on. She led the way again, at the practiced lope of a hunter, faster than a walk with Josur ambling at her side. Abeka matched her stride, Connor behind her, less graceful but keeping up without difficulty. Roland came behind, stumbling a little. Tariq brought up the rear, turning often to look behind. Lumio had emerged from passive form and was now draped over Tariq's shoulder, the otter watching as carefully as the man. I think someone's following us said Tariq quietly to the otter, 
we had best keep a careful eye out. Roland looked behind him and almost slipped again. The air was misty. Or was it something in his eyes? He could see nothing but crushed green foliage on the path behind them, and trees crowding in on all sides. The clearing they reached was as large as Concorba's central market square back home. Saplings and ferns grew in around the edges, like eager children watching from the outskirts of a game. But the rest of it was the spiky elephant grass Lichet had mentioned. Most of it was waist high, but some bigger clumps were taller even than Tariq. It didn't look much like real grass to Roland. It grew too high and had blades like long swords. Lichet stopped where the jungle began to thin out and looked ahead. Josur prowled around, sniffing at the ground, his tail quivering. He smells rhinos, said Lichet quietly, but it may not be recent. What does Essex see, Roland? Uh, what? asked Roland. He tried to concentrate, but he just felt foggy. He couldn't think clearly. Where's Essex, Roland? asked Rebecca. What can she see? Roland looked up at the sky. He couldn't feel Essex anywhere nearby, and her sense impressions were vague. I'm not sure, he muttered. He wiped his sweaty forehead and blinked. The taste of bird flesh and the crunch of tiny bones filled his mouth. I think she is eating, but if there was anything, she'd warn us. I'm sure of it. Our path continues over there, said Lichet, pointing to the far side of the clearing, between those two great trees. But two other trails come in, one on each side. Keep a careful lookout. We must cross as quickly as we can, all together at a run. Is everyone ready? The group all nodded. No one noticed that Roland's nod continued almost to his chest. He jerked back as his chin hit his neck and wiped more sweat off his forehead. Surely he couldn't be as tired as he felt, he thought. It was just the heat, and once he got out in the clearing, there would be more air. Josua will lead, said Lichet. Let's go. The tiger bounded out into the clearing, with Lichet and Abeka right behind him. Connor was next, with Roland close behind. Tariq once again came last, staying a good distance behind the others, acting as rear guard. They were halfway across when Josur stopped and roared. It was not like the lion's roar that Abeka had described, but rather a series of connected, throaty snarls. With the tiger's roar, there was sudden movement in the tall tufts of grass all around them. Small rhinos stood up from where they had been lying in the long grass, hidden from sight. Their riders, short but wiry men and women, leaped onto the rhinos' backs, riding without saddles or reins. They wore cotton robes that crossed across their chest, leaving their forearms and feet free. All of them had long knives at their belts, and either a lance or a long bamboo blowpipe. The rhinos themselves were as Lichet had described them, smaller than the Niloan variety, with sharper horns and smart, vibrant black eyes. There were rhino riders everywhere, at least sixty of them, too many to fight. Escape was the only option. But they were surrounded. Tariq was the first to move. He was the closest to the riders, and he had Lumio to help him. He twisted on the spot, ran at the rider behind him, threw Lumio in the air, and slid under the startled rhino's legs as it thrust its horn up in an attempt to gore the flying otter. Emerging out the other side, Tariq caught Lumio and slapped the rhino hard on the rump, surprising it so much it staggered away. Follow me, he called to the others. Hurry! The others responded as quickly as they could. Connor called Brigan, and Uraza sprang snarling from Abeka's arm. But the rhino riders were advancing, blowpipes at their mouths. Dozens of tiny darts flew across the clearing. Aided by their spirit animals, the green cloaks danced and jumped and ducked through the storm of darts, trying to keep together to break past the ever-shifting rhinos and reach Tariq, 
where he stood just outside the circle, unable to help them. But Roland wasn't running with them. He felt really sick now, unable to work out what was going on. One of the small darts struck him on the cheek, just like the biting insects that loved him so much. Roland pulled it out and looked at it, wondering why they bothered to shoot such tiny, ineffective darts. The point of it was smeared with a dark, sticky material. Roland stared at it, but he didn't figure out what it was until he heard Lichet shouting, as if from far away. Poison! Wear poison on the darts! Don't let them strike your skin! But the air was thick with them. Not even Lachey could avoid them. The last thing Roland saw, as the strength rushed out of his limbs and he fell to the ground, was Tariq sprinting toward the jungle, much faster than any normal man could run, with several rhino riders crashing after him. Chapter 9 Unexpected Reunion how do you know your way through the maze? Malin asked Shu, as the old woman unhesitatingly chose to go left at the next intersection of paths. Her pack was so tall that from behind she looked like a mass of pots and pans with legs, but each bit of metal was carefully tied and separated, so that they made hardly any noise. Practice, replied Shu shortly. When will we get to the South Fort? asked Malin. Later, said Shu. Melin opened her mouth to ask for a more detailed response, then shut it. She had already learned that if Shu didn't want to talk, she wouldn't. The girl stopped to look behind her, to make sure Ji was keeping up and hadn't stopped to eat bamboo shoots. The panda was about thirty yards behind, but at least she was ambling along. A few rats ran across in front of her, some of the many that thronged among the bamboo, eating the fallen flowers. From somewhere ahead came the sound of axes on bamboo. Maylin whirled around. Shu had stopped. She was standing completely still, listening. More axes joined, the single chopping boom multiplying. There were many axes at work, not too far away, accompanied by the sound of bamboo falling. Someone's cutting the bamboo! said Maylin, instantly thinking of the conquerors. We will go see, Shu said. If we are separated, Ji knows the way to the South Fort. Ji knows the way? asked Maylin. I told her while you slept. Shu shrugged off her huge pack and carefully slid it into the bamboo so that it was hidden from sight. Once again Maylin was impressed with how easily she moved for such an old lady. Be quiet now. We must sneak up and look. It can't be the loyalists you spoke of, said Malin quietly, as they walked toward the noise, thinking of her father. Only servants of the Devourer would attack the maze. Shu nodded and held her finger against her lips for silence. The sound of the chopping was getting much louder, loud enough to drown out any noise they might make, thought Malin, but she obeyed anyway. She looked around again and was surprised to see Chi had caught up with them and was only a few steps behind. She didn't know the panda could move so quickly. They all stopped a few yards short of the next intersection. The sound of chopping was really loud, interspersed with occasional shouts and orders. There had to be hundreds of people at work, and they were close. Shu and Mei Lin crept forward slowly. The path only went for a dozen yards or so before it opened out into a great highway that was being cut through the maze. There was a line of axe-wielders stretching far into the distance, all busily chopping away. Other workers were dragging the fallen bamboo back to huge piles that were probably going to be burnt. Behind the line of workers, there were soldiers, many of them with spirit animals. Like the attackers at Jano Riana, they did not wear uniforms, but Mei Lin had no doubt who they were. They carried whips as well as their weapons, and used them whenever the workers slowed down. If you cannot think through something, you destroy it, 
said Shu. That is the way of the devourer. We must... She stopped in mid-sentence. The super-sharp chopsticks Maylin had seen the night before suddenly appeared in the old woman's hands, and she lunged up into the air above Maylin's shoulder. There was a scream, and a hooded, masked figure, dressed entirely in the yellow-green of the bamboo, fell to the ground. Maylin whirled around, her staff raised just in time to counter a vicious strike from the dagger of another camouflaged attacker. She knocked the weapon aside, and followed it up with a blow to the collarbone that made the assassin drop the dagger and howl in pain, her arm hanging limp and useless. But more assassins were jumping down to the path. Maylin backed up, her eyes flickering across them and up into the bamboo, noting the iron spikes driven into the stalks. These enemies had been lurking up there, standing on the spikes, ready to jump down on anyone passing underneath. A series of piercing whistles echoed through the bamboo forest, raising the alarm. We must go, said Shu, pointing with her blood-stained chopstick to the right-hand path. Two assassins had dropped there, and there were more above. Now! She charged forward, Maylin at her side. There was a blur of chopsticks and staff, and the two blocking assassins fell wounded to either side. Their companions above were too slow, dropping behind the old woman and the girl. But Chi had been left behind, and now there were half a dozen assassins between Mei Lin and the panda. Chi! shouted Mei Lin, raising her arm. She might be too far away, but if Chi could assume the dormant state, then they could flee. There was a chance... Ji didn't return to her. Instead, the panda calmly reached up and uprooted one of the shorter bamboo stalks, grunting as she lifted the massive, thirty-foot-long stalk completely out of the ground. Gripping it clumsily between her paws, she let it fall straight down the path toward the heads of the assassins. They jumped aside, the huge length of bamboo bouncing off the ground. Ji did not let go. She shook the bamboo, sweeping the path from side to side, catching the assassin's legs and sending them toppling. When the last of them was groaning on the ground, the panda dropped the bamboo and sauntered along toward Mei Lin, who was staring open-mouthed at her companion. But she did not have much time to marvel. The guards from the clearing operation had heard the whistled alarms, and a score or more were running toward them with spirit animals outpacing them in front. Maylin noticed one in particular, an ibex with large backswept horns. She was sure she had seen it at the fall of Jano Rion. We must run, said Shu. We need to slow them down, said Maylin. She looked at Ji, new admiration for the panda filling her mind. Ji, can you block the path with bamboo? Ji responded by pulling down a long bamboo stalk across the path and then another, and then a third, weaving it through the first two, in a display of both great strength and precision. In just a few minutes, she added half a dozen more, blocking the path completely. Now we run, said Mei Lin. Chi made a kind of bleating noise. Lazy, said Shu. Mei Lin looked puzzled, then laughed and raised her arm. Chi disappeared, and the panda tattoo appeared on Mei Lin's hand. They ran for a surprisingly long time, Shu choosing the turnings with total confidence. Eventually, the sounds of pursuit and cracking bamboo were left far behind them. After a while, Mei Lin started to hope that Shu would stop for a rest because she was out of breath herself. Surely an old woman couldn't run so far. Finally, Shu slowed and began to walk. Soon, You'll come to the south fort, a left and a right, and then straight ahead, she said. I will leave you now. Leave me? asked Melin, surprised. Where will you go? Back for my pack, said Shu. Back? But the enemy is there. I will go around them, said Shu, as if this was as easy in the maze as anywhere. Oh, said Melin. I was hoping you might... might come with me, with us. I've seen you fight. 
I know I could learn from you, and you could help the Loyalists against the Conquerors. I have my own business, said Shu. You'll fight well too, considering. With practice, one day, you might be worth teaching. Meilin blinked. She was used to being told she was a great student, the best fighter of her age. But she bit back a hurt retort. There was something about the old woman that demanded respect. Beyond her fighting ability with sharpened chopsticks, her astonishing endurance and nimbleness. Suddenly, Maylin added two and two. Are you one of the marked? she asked. Shu smiled, showing several missing teeth. She opened the top of her silk blouse to reveal a secret pocket. A white, jumping mouse blinked up at Mei Lin, its eyes miniature versions of the old woman's, dark and penetrating and mischievous. Zap, she said. The mouse vanished, even as Shu rolled up her sleeve to show the tattoo of a leaping mouse on her forearm. Good fortune, Mei Lin and Ji. Perhaps we will meet again one day. Mei Lin bowed her head. When she looked up, Shu was gone. The south fort was half a mile farther along the path, past several intersections. Though still inside the maze, it was built in a small, shallow valley where many paths met. Mei Ling came out of the shadow of the bamboo and looked out across the open expanse of bare earth, down to the cluster of huts behind a wooden palisade below. Though there was bamboo forest all around the valley, she still felt cheered to be out of the maze, at least for now. Halt! Three soldiers in the crimson lacquered armor of the regular Zhongyi's army hurried up toward her. One of them wore the braided armband of a corporal. I am Mei Lin, daughter of... Mei Lin started to say, but her words were drowned out by the sudden bark of the corporal. Drop your staff and kneel! I will not, said Mei Lin. Escort me to whoever is in command here. The corporal scowled and drew his sword. A moment later, the other two drew their swords as well. Our orders are to kill anyone who comes out of the maze who is not in uniform, he said. So we will kill you. Don't be stupid, said Mei Lin. Though as she looked at the man's piggish eyes, she realized he probably was extremely stupid. Call an officer at once. No peasant out of the bamboo tells me what to do, roared the corporal. Kneel down. Corporal, maybe we'd better, said one of the soldiers, who looked considerably smarter than his superior. Shut up, roared the corporal. He raised his sword. Intruder, kneel for execution. It really would be best to call your officer, sighed Mei Lin. She raised her own staff. The moves she needed to knock down the three soldiers were already flitting through her head. She knew exactly what to do. But she didn't attack. Even a few days before, she would have angrily knocked them down and stormed over to the fort to complain to whoever was in charge. But now she kept her anger in check and stood there patiently, just as she had waited patiently with G as night fell in the maze, for the sound of Shu cooking dinner to become apparent to her. Sometimes patience was the best strategy. The corporal didn't keep his anger in check. He rushed at her, slashing with his sword. Malin swayed aside and just slid her staff between his legs so that he stumbled past her and fell over, dropping his sword. He crawled after it, shouting at the others. Attack! What are you waiting for? The two soldiers looked at each other. Attack! croaked the corporal from the ground. The smart-looking soldier sheathed his sword and took a horn from his belt. He blew two sharp blasts from it, the sound echoing across the small valley. A few seconds later, there was an answering pair of blasts from the fort below. A patrol will come now, he said, with an officer. What did you say your name was? Mei Lin, daughter of General Teng. The two soldiers exchanged a horrified look, and the corporal on the ground groaned. 
Who is in charge here? asked Meilin. The soldiers braced to attention. The corporal staggered up, but only in order to bow low before her. The exalted general, blurted the clever soldier. General who? she asked, telling herself not to hope. Teng, of course, your father. Relief ripped through Mei Lin. He had escaped from Jano Rian after all. He was alive. Take me to him, immediately. You're really his, stammered the corporal. That is, you are really... This way, mistress, said the clever soldier, as the patrol appeared, jogging toward them. Once again, he had shown he was much quicker on the uptake than his superior. We will be honoured to provide you with a personal escort. Maylin followed him, feeling a warm rush of happiness. Everything would be all right now that she knew her father was alive. They would soon be together again, and side by side they would fight to wrest Zhong from the clutches of the conquerors. With the realisation of who she was, everything moved quickly, but not quickly enough for Mei Lin, who had waited long, hard days for this moment. The loyalist soldiers escorted her into the fort, and she was saluted at the gate to the palisade. Her father was standing on the parade ground, tall in his silver and crimson armour, and her eyes pricked with tears on seeing him. It was all she could do not to run to him and throw herself into his arms. But such an open display of affection would shame him in front of his officers. He was standing with several high-ranking loyalists that Mei Lin knew. He looked tired, she thought, and somehow not quite as tall as she remembered. His uniform was torn, its brilliant insignia gone. From a distance, she might not have recognized him at all. Exalted General, said the soldier, falling back out of respect. Teng turned and caught sight of Mei Lin, and his eyes widened in shock. Mei Lin! Father! She stopped three paces from him and bowed low before him. His footsteps approached. Two muddy boots came into view. Strong hands gripped her shoulders and raised her to an upright position. Their brown eyes locked, and in them she saw love and worry in equal measures. And were those tears she saw on the brink of falling? Impossible. For a giddying moment, she thought that he might actually embrace her. Then he stepped back, letting her go and allowing his hands to fall to his sides. So you are here, he said. Why? Are you alone? There was a slight tone of rebuke in his voice, which she thought she must surely be misinterpreting. I left the green cloaks, father, to come back to fight for Zhong, she said. You should know that a large force of conquerors is cutting away through the maze. General Teng nodded slowly. Your spirit animal, Ji, is still with you? Mei Lin showed the tattoo on her arm. You have learned to work with her, use her powers? I am beginning to learn, father. Good, said General Teng. We will take tea, and I will hear of your activities. There are things I must tell you, too. But the conquerors, father... She couldn't read him. Why wasn't he worried about the nearness of the enemy? They are several miles distant, but there is a great host, hundreds of soldiers at least, forcing many more workers to cut the bamboo. It will take them at least a week to cut even a mile through the maze. General Chin? Her father's closest aide and friend stepped up beside them and nodded at Mei Lin in recognition. Chin's uniform was worn and didn't appear to have been washed for days. Mei Lin was relieved to see that he had survived the invasion as well, but if he was relieved to see her in return, he didn't show it. Shall I give the order to move out, sir? He asked General Teng. Not yet, but begin preparations and double the guards on the upper paths, ordered her father. 
Is there any chance you were followed through the maze, Maylin? I'm certain I was not, she said. We had to fight camouflaged assassins near the cutting, but we got away. We? asked General Teng. A woman named Shu helped me, said Mei Lin. One of the marked. I think she used to be a green cloak. Maybe long ago. She's old, but still strong. We know Shu, said General Teng. She is true to Zhang, and a friend of our cause. I'm pleased that she helped you, although somewhat surprised. Come, let's drink tea, and we will talk. What is there to talk about, father? she said. I've come to fight with you, in your army. Tell me what to do, and I will do it. Mei Lin, it is not so simple. It is perfectly simple. Mei Lin, enough. Remember who you are. The rebuke was as startling as a slap. Mei Lin felt her cheeks grow warm. She knew exactly who she was, and what she had travelled so far to do. If he was going to tell her that she was too precious and noble to fight with him against the conquerors, then he would really have a fight on his hands. Before she could say anything, horn blasts came from higher up the valley, near where Mei Lin had emerged from the maze. Four sharp blasts in a row. She knew that signal. It was an alarm, not a call for a patrol. General Chin let out a gasp of surprise. We've been discovered, snapped General Teng. To arms, all warriors! Gongs took up the alarm, their deep warning chimes echoing through the treetops. Soldiers ran out from the barracks buildings, forming up in ranks. Teng turned to General Chin. Take Mei Lin to the eastern entrance and instruct her on how to reach Fa Sit Nang. We'll hold here for as long as possible, then rendezvous with you at the southeast supply camp. Make certain my daughter does not turn back when she leaves you. Father, I won't go, not again, exclaimed Mei Lin. I am a warrior, and I will fight for Zhong. General Teng shook his head firmly. You are a warrior, yes, but you are a green cloak too. That is where your duty lies. No, father, it lies with you. A second time he gripped her by the shoulders, forcing her to look at him. No, Mei Lin. We have received word that there are green cloaks in Farsit Nang. You must find them and rejoin them. You should never have left them. Chin will tell you how to get there. Go now. Malin stared at him, unwilling to accept what he was saying, not caring if he or anyone else saw her tears. How could he send her off again just like that? She didn't want to rejoin the Green Cloaks. She didn't believe they could properly resist the conquerors. Only Zhong, the true Zhong, had the strength to do that. Father, I came all this way. Do not argue with me. The four fallen are meant to be together. I am sure of this. My hope lies with you, with them. He lowered his voice. And you are not safe among us. What? What do you mean? The enemy has found us too swiftly for it to be an accident. General Teng was almost whispering now, making sure she and she alone heard him over the sound of soldiers preparing for battle. There is treachery here, or something more sinister. Either way, they want you and G, and I will not let them have you. You will obey me, Mei Lin. Go now, and go swiftly. Mei Lin stepped away from him, shocked to the core by everything he had told her. Treachery. Among the loyalists. She could barely credit it. But she had to believe him, and she had to accept that what he asked her to do, he did in good faith. Not because he thought her weak. Mei Lin, you still stand before me! I beg you to go! How can you still not see what must be done? His words were so harsh, his disbelief so strong. Mei Lin felt suddenly cold, despite the heat, as if she had been drenched with ice-cold water. Maybe G was meant to be with Essex, Brigan, and Uraza, and that meant Mei Lin was too. 
she had left the others in anger, just as Finn had warned her not to before their journey to Yora. A blind anger that had sent her off to seek what she wanted, not what was best. She blinked back tears. To find her father, and then to be sent away from him again. There was a pain in her heart that felt agonizing. But she had to bear it. He was beseeching her, not just ordering her. It was as though he was treating her as an equal, an obstinate equal, who could not be made to understand something fundamental. Yes, father, she whispered. I will go at once. As you should, he said in a tone she was more familiar with. When she straightened, she thought she caught a hint of a smile behind his stern expression. A sad smile, but it was there. General Chin, I'm ready, she said, half turning to address the words to her father's old friend. Farewell, father. Farewell, Maylin. They turned away from each other at the same time. General Teng moved quickly to join the soldiers, who were already marching out through the fort's gates. Meilin was hustled in the opposite direction by General Chin, who kept looking over his shoulder, back up the valley. Meilin looked too, feeling as though a large part of her heart was being left behind with every step. The battle had already begun. A small group of loyalist soldiers stood shield to shield in the narrow exit from the maze, but for every enemy they slew, another three hurled themselves against the shield wall, and there were bowmen climbing the bamboo with iron spikes, like the assassins who had attempted to waylay Meilin. Within minutes they would be in position, ready to rain arrows down upon the defenders. Only the narrowness of the path and the bravery of the loyalist soldiers were holding the invaders back. Meilin could hear the shouts and screams, and the clash of steel on steel drifting down on the wind. But the defenders could not last, even with her father and his soldiers racing to reinforce them. If we're lucky, they will hold till nightfall and can escape under the cover of darkness, said Chin. I just don't understand how the conquerors found the way through the maze so quickly. They didn't follow me said Meilin defensively. I'm sure of it. Maybe they've got bird spirit animals, like Essex, and they mapped the maze from above. We shoot all birds, said Chin, and then shook his head, as though dismissing a troublesome thought. Come, it's two days hard walking to Farsit Nang. We must get you away quickly so I can join the fight. I will tell you the turns through the maze. Listen 